Happy New Year, our dear audience. Good afternoon, good evening, good morning, good viewers, wherever you're listening. The more you read, the more things you will know, the more that you will learn, the more places you will go. Dr. Soix. It's a pleasure to have you join us for our third book talk, The, Hav the Havoc of Choice by Wanjiro Koinange. We're really excited to have Wanjiro join us this evening. This webinar will be recorded and can be accessed on our YouTube page as well as on our website and our videos in the coming week. As we proceed, you are welcome to submit your questions using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. The moderator will address your questions at the end of our session today. For more engaging programs, please subscribe to our mailing list by visiting our contact us page on our website, globalcenters.columbia.edu um, forward slash Nairobi, globalcenters.columbia.edu forward slash Nairobi. Also, please spread word about us. We have a variety of programs that cover diverse topics across professions and even for students. I would now like to hand over to our director, Dr. Murugi Durango, to make the welcome remarks. Welcome, Dr. Durango. Thank you, Pauline. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to our audience, and welcome. My name is Murugi Durango. I'm the director of Columbia Global Centers Nairobi. Uh, CGC Nairobi is one of nine centers across the globe established by Columbia University to create opportunities for shared learning and to deepen the nature of global dialogue. Today, we are delighted to host the third in a series of virtual book talks featuring African authors. We hope to offer a platform where African writers can engage a global audience, offering not just their work, but exciting perspectives on how personal, political and cultural experiences drive their storytelling. Today's talk will feature Wanjiro Koinange, author of the novel, The Havoc of Choice, and will be moderated by Dr. Moshai Mwangola. Moshai Mwangola is a performance scholar who uses the lens of culture in her work as an academic, artist and activist. She holds a doctorate in performance studies from the Northwestern University, USA, a Master's of Creative Arts from the University of Melbourne in Australia, and a Bachelor of Education from Kenyatta University. Mwangola chairs the board of Uraia Trust, which is the biggest non-state facilitator of civic education in Kenya. A member of the Executive Committee of the Council of the, Deve of, uh, the Development of Social Science Research in Africa, CODESTRIA. She's also a founder member of the Intellectual Collectives, the Elephant and the Oracha Collective. Uh, through the latter's artistic arm, the Performance Collective, she facilitates the monthly Point Zero Book Cafe, which features public performances and conversations around literature. Let me now invite Mshai to introduce Wanjiro Koinange. Welcome, Mshai. Thank you very, very much, Dr. Ndirangu. It's always such a joy. This has become a really special time where we think about books, we talk to writers, we get to know a little bit more about them and some of the things that they are doing. And it is such a pleasure um, today to have uh, one of, I, I mean, I was just thinking about it and I thought I cannot think of a better book for us to start out 2021. Um, we were talking about this earlier and I was just like, wow, I don't know how deliberately this was thought out, whether we thought it out, or it was just one of those amazing things where the universe just aligns. And it is such a pleasure to have Wanjiro Koinange with us. I'm going to introduce Wanjiro in, in, in a way of having a conversation, but just um, very, very briefly, many of you know Wanjiro, um, not so much from her book, which we will talk about, and her other writing, but as one of the founders of BookBank, um, and also a founder of Bank Books, and we'll come and talk a little bit about what that means. Uh, Monjiro has been very active in very many ways in terms of curating, participating, um, just 
making it possible for people to be in spaces, especially Africans, to be in spaces where there are exchanges of ideas. And we will be talking a little bit more about that before we come to her book. But Wanjiro, let me just start first by saying Karibu Sana. Welcome, welcome, and it's such a joy to have you. Thank you so, so much, Mshai. And thank you to Dr. Dirangu and, and Pauline for the invitation to all of you, actually. Um, I'm so thrilled to be here. I'm excited about this conversation. And so am I, you know, and I'm going to say this before, what I really love to do usually is to just start off right at the beginning to start us with a little bit of a taster of your book. So we'll start with, I'll do a little bit of a reading of her book of choice. But I did want to say that this is what for me was so special. I read the book um, last year, but this year I came back to read it. And it was special to me because I do like to take time at the beginning of the year, because I think it's important for us as Kenyans to, to, to keep remembering what happened in 2007, 2008. And I think for me, that time of transition is always a time of making myself, I think it's part of my civic duty to remember. And so there's that. But then of course, in the last year, in the last, you know, in the last um, fortnight, in the last couple of weeks, all the news all over the world has been filled with conversations on elections. Um, and tomorrow we know um, Uganda is having an, an election. We know Ghana has just gone through a process of um, swearing in a president. I think yesterday he gave, um, or just the other day he gave his inaugural speech. And then with the United States, all of these places are making us think about this fraught space of presidential elections, especially when they're so contentious. So I just want to thank you that um, for giving us this gift, this place of remembrance. And, and, and just wonder, why is this so important to you, this place of memory, this place of, it's in the past, but it's actually here with us at the same time. Why is this important? Um, that's such a brilliant question, but also you've, you've answered it so brilliantly. It's still here with us. 07 um, and the post-election violence that followed that election happened over 10 years ago now, but, but the repercussions keep coming back and every time an election comes back the same cycle continues albeit not as, as dramatic and as not as 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 intense as the other one was but it happens all the time and i think that we have institutionalized amnesia as a country we we have accepted and moved on and gotten become experts at doing it and it's important for me because this story wouldn't go away for me i was here in 07 i lived in this country i worked here i was living in nairobi i'd even worked on that specific election and had accepted and moved on like most of us did but a few years later when you begin to ask but how can this happen and how can so many people die and how can there be no collective way to talk mourn grieve sit in our grief together for those who those who went through it and the lack of that has has just kept coming back to me and even now it's been it's been I mean it took eight years to write the book and it's been about eight months since it's been out now um, maybe slightly less and it's still I still don't have the answer it's still curious to me I still want to flee every time it's time to have a, a general election and that's not a, what I think elections are supposed to be about it's supposed to be this important moment for, in our citizenry but but it's become this trauma dramatic one um, and quite it's quite sanctioned this thing that we keep doing um, so it's, it's still it's still quite strange <laughs> even after spending all this time researching and writing about the book I still think that 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 we moved on far too quickly and that because we, we were encouraged to forget we run the risk of it happening again and I don't want that to happen in my country yeah, I know this has almost become a cliche in Kenya where we quote what Yvonne O'War says about Kenya's official languages being English, Kiswahili and silence. But there was also memory. That line has now become my favorite. I used to always talk about the silence part of it, but now I really, really reflect on those, on those last words. There was also memory. And then of course, your book is about, it's set in Kenya, it's about Kenya. It's also set partly in the United States and we'll talk about this a little bit about it. But even though in some ways it's a really Kenyan story, it's also a story that is a story that could happen anywhere in the world, I, I, I think, even in places, especially in places where you're so confident, we have our act together, you know, yeah. the things that happen in those other countries are definitely not going to happen here. And then you wake up one morning and it's like, hey, yeah, what mm -hmm. just yeah. happened? Yeah. And how did it happen? Yeah. 
it's strange because essentially we're all connected by the things that we all want. It doesn't matter if you live in, in India or in Kenya or in the US, you, we all want to feel respected. We all want good leadership. We all want the basic values that we strive for as, as human beings who have a moral compass that is as, as <laughs> I guess, as at par with a regular one as possible. We all want the same thing. Um, and, and that's why I guess my biggest panic when this book, when I was writing this book was if, if it will resonate with the, with the audience outside of Kenya. And it is resonating because corruption is corruption is corruption and fraud is fraud is fraud and pain is pain. And so is love and joy and all of these things that, that the book speaks about are such universal um, themes and desires. And they're the things that we all, we all I think strive for um, regardless of where you live. Why don't we do this? Let me let me give, and I'm just going to do the first three minutes. When you enter the book, this is what you're going to, this is what's going to bring you into the world. And then we'll come back and talk a little bit about your journey to write in this book, and then we'll come back to the book. But these are just the first three minutes of the book. One, vanilla ice cream, 12th December, 2007. Kavata was having trouble focusing on the sermon that Sunday. She had to keep reminding herself she was doing the right thing. Each time she felt doubt, she would slide her fingers into her handbag, feeling the side pocket to ensure that the envelope was still there. Her mind went over every detail. Then, satisfied she had seen to every aspect of her plan forced herself to pay attention to Pastor Simon. She would need something to talk over, about over lunch. Pastor Simon, what a powerful sermon and so well researched, Googie said. Thank you. The two men shook hands as their wives embraced. Yes, Pastor, truly, truly inspiring. Kavata kissed the air around Grace's cheeks and complimented her on her lovely hat. They seem to get larger each Sunday. <laughs> Ngugi, Kavata, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> From your lips to the Lord's ears. When the pastor spoke, he often chuckled as if he had cracked a joke only he had heard. Please join us for lunch today. We won't accept no for an answer. Besides, it's the least we can do after those wonderful words, isn't it, darling? Kavata channeled her most dazzling smile and glanced over at Ngugi, who caught her eye with a flash of irritation before turning back to the pastor with a smile, out dazzling Kavata's by far. She knew he had intended to play golf later that afternoon, but this was important and he had to make sacrifices. She also knew Googi would never say no to Pastor Simon. Googi didn't miss a beat. Yes, do come over. I want to hear how those plans for the new sanctuary in Westlands are going. I've been meaning to make an anonymous donation, but have been too busy to go over the paperwork. That's understandable. Things must be quite crazy at the moment. How is the campaign going? See, these are the final days, Grace said, pretending to be the only person in the country who wasn't keeping up with the coming election on a minute to minute basis. She had a reputation for weaseling her way into the congregants' homes. This was something she justified to theirs, those who dared ask by saying that for years, she had given up on the luxury of sleeping in on Sunday mornings. This was payback. When the church elders proposed that the pastoral teams only visit the homes of congregants who formally registered as members of the church, Grace was the first to oppose it. Less than a third of the congregation were registered members and most of them went for the first service. But the law passed and now lunch invitations were a rarity. So Grace praisefully accepted Kavata's invitation. Kavata spotted her daughter Wanja, guiding her younger brother Amani towards them. 
thank you. That's such a great beginning. But we'll come back to that. Let me not get Can into that. Can I just how incredible that was? Like, it's, I think you're the first person who's a, perform, a performer that I've actually had read this. That was so, that was so great. Thank you. For, oh, thank you. For that it's, a, it's a great passage to read. Like, I was like, ah, this is such a great book. But anyway, let's now, I'll come first. Let's talk about you. Because I think one of the things I found was really interesting is that a lot of the writers um, that I've talked to, it's writing isn't the first thing that they come to. But you seem to have been very clear, like straight off from high school, you were like, I'm a writer. That's what I'm going to do. And so you went off and studied writing. Tell me a little bit more about that. Yeah, I, I always knew I wanted to write. The only time I doubted that was when I wanted to, to fly, to become a pilot. And I actually did go to flying school. And the guy at the admission desk in the school I was in, I think Florida, Ohio, Ohio at the time, he, he saw me and said, this is great, but you're so young, go and get a degree in something else and then, and then come back. And I did, I, I came back home, I went to USIU, I got a degree in journalism because that's the only thing I could find that was writing adjacent. Cause I knew that, that I wanted to do something creative. I had tried, I had tried everything else. Don't get me wrong. I tried the singing and the painting and the, and the dancing. And I was not good at those, but I had always been really, um, good with my words. I enjoyed getting lost in, 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 in words. And my life stopped when I read Purple Hibiscus for the first time. And I, and I suddenly the, the life, the world of African literature just became new to me again. I must've been a teenager then, um, or at least in, in my like 18, 19 years old at that point, maybe, maybe, maybe a bit younger. Um, but yeah, I've always known and I pursued it, but I've also been aware that, um, that intentionality is something that I that I that I strive for. So even if I want to become a writer, what kind of life do I want? Do I want to write all the time? Can I write all the time? When I did a quick kind of search, I didn't see writers who are making the kind of money that that the the authors of of Harry Potter and all and the likes were making. And that was a real thing. And I like shiny things, but I've never been a, afraid to admit that I just I like I like to travel. I like things. So because the writing wasn't a question for me the question was always the balance and how can I do things that are writing adjacent that can earn me the, the, my, my income and my lifestyle and can secure my lifestyle and my livelihood but 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 also keep me writing and I've been very lucky and very deliberate about about those things so all through all through university even if I wasn't necessarily working in the journalism field I was working for musicians and I was surrounded by by creativity and the and the connection that creativity, creativity made with social justice um, kind of stuck with me then in those early years. Um, and then I just wrote every time, I, every chance I could get, whoever would pay me or give me a job that involved writing, I would take it. I wrote press releases, I wrote blog articles, I wrote for true love, I wrote for anyone that would take take um, my, my words. And that's still something that I, I try to do. Even now with the work that I do, it may not involve me writing fiction all the time but it definitely makes sure that I'm flexing my creative muscles I mean other ways uh, and, and you know I find this interesting and by the way USIU those of you who are wondering United States International University yeah. is in the book so if you want to know a little bit more about that <laughs> read read the book but I also found that when and I and I read both not just the havoc of choice but your other writing and that mm -hmm. foundation of journalism of being able your descriptions like everything you write, those questions, the who, the what, the why, the, you're so good at creating the context so that when you tell the story, whether it's fiction or nonfiction, it really does come alive. And, and so I really appreciated um, that about even in the book, but also in your other writing, which I do want to talk about, but also that apart from journalism, you also then went and studied creative writing. So you're somebody who clearly craft is important to you because some of the writers last week, we, the last time we talked to Kinyanji Kombani and Kinyanji is a banker, but he writes, you know, and it's not something, I mean, he, he does pay attention to questions of craft, but you have clearly invested in that. Why did you think after getting a degree in journalism, you needed to get another degree in, in creative writing? Um, because I really enjoy school and I, and I go back even now I'm just like PhD when I really, really enjoy yes. school. Not, 
because not because I, I don't know if you learn anything more by being confined within the four walls of a classroom. What I know you learn from is time dedicated spending on this topic, right? I don't think I would have ever written this book A if I didn't study journalism, because you're right, the thing about balance and the thing about being able to look at all of the sides of a coin and still tell the story, even if it's not what you want to say, but it's the truth, then you have to tell it. That was something that was in, drilled into me um, in journalism, during journalism. The masters of the decision about what was, was because A, I like, I like school and B, I realized that working in the creative industry in Nairobi, I'd never get the time to finish a book. I'd always be too distracted. I would always um, be, be challenged about paying rent and, and being able to maintain my lifestyle. So I knew that I had to get away <laughs> to write my first book. Um, and, and if you've tried to get away on a Kenyan passport, you know that the, <laughs> that the kind of visas that you can get are very limited and school made sense. Um, and, and to be honest, while I, I, I know there's a lot of kind of controversy around the thing that, that, that creative academies do for creativity, I think it's important because while I will, I, I'm still, I still don't know where I stand about the thing about creativity, can it be taught? Can creativity be taught? I don't know. But anything you dedicate time to, you will get better at. Um, and that's why the, the master's was important to me because I wanted to write a first book. I had failed at trying to do it while I was holding down a job. So I quit the job and I went away and I, and I wrote the book. And the reason why the masters also work out is because in, with any graduate program, for as long as you're paying fees, you can be there for six years, just pay your fees. And I didn't have six years worth of fees. I'm like, I only have two, so like, let's do this. And I'm, and until today, I, I know that I need that structure. And I, I always encourage writers to find the thing that works for them. And school, school is what worked for me. And, and you did, so this was your thesis project, but thesis then you project. took a really long time to, to get it out in terms of publication. If you did it for your thesis project, why did it take so long? What was because, it that else you felt you needed to do? Because I'd written this story and I thought it was powerful and I knew I was onto something and I knew it asked important questions because the, the people who had read it had, had got, even though the word Kenyan had had this really real and um, emotional and strong reaction to the first draft, which was horrible as you, I'm sure you know, first drafts are just, they're not to be trusted. But then um, I also knew that it was a big story and a big Kenyan story. And I had written this book while I was sitting away in a really cushy part of, of Cape Town in the university where I had a room to myself and I was a grad school benefits and all of these things. So I was pretty far removed as one can get from like what, what the Kenyan experience was, not even in 07, but even every day. And when I came back home, having finished my master's and then my thesis, um, while the, the story was real, there's a text it lacked from having been written abroad. When I was sitting in cafes writing, there was cafes in Cape Town. So I was hearing South Africans speak and I was hearing the Cape Town accent and I was hearing all of these things that were not Kenyan and those things came into, the, in, into my writing. So I needed to kind of keep coming back to it and editing it um, while I lived here because then I needed to understand, oh yeah, actually Kenyans don't speak like that. We say this and like, we have this beautiful thing we do with language where we shape shift based on who you're speaking to and, and how, and the difficulty of the thing you're trying to, 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 to communicate. I always say that there's some things I can never say in, in English because like only Kiswahili or Kiku, you can carry them, right? And those things, those textures, things that make the books, I think very beautiful came as a result of, of working on it here. But also I recognize my place as the, 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 the voice that will be attached to this book and the topic of the book. Um, it's a big topic. Um, I'm, a, I'm a young woman, um, it's my first novel. I haven't, I haven't necessarily at this point created a name for myself as a writer. So I wanted to be sure that the things I was saying I could stand by, I could defend, even if they were not mine. And I still try to, to, to remind people that it's fiction and that the characters are, are fictional. Um, but I needed to be able to defend it. Um, and, I, and I had to put the book through the process of getting it ready for me to defend it. And that involved getting editors who are different day and night from who I am to, and asking them to read the book and, and, and tear it apart and so I can put it back together. And that's what took eight years. Um, the first draft took nine months to write, but that going back to it every year, spending six to eight months going back to this text and questioning it and also having to deal with the thing that it, it's doing for the readers now, I, I, those things that happened to me as well. And I had to be very careful and, and intentional about putting it out when it was ready. So the other thing I find, I mean, and I appreciate what you say, I, when I was reading it through, like the, the attention to historical detail, like if you said this happened, it happened. Um, when you talk about the geography, there's a lot of traveling. I think people travel in, 
almost every means that, you know, people fly, people go by bus, by lorry, they walk. I mean, they, you know, it's, it's train everything, but then it's so authentic to, this is how long it takes to travel, or this is what the experience of being in a police lorry, you know, is like. And, and, and it's clear that you've taken attention. This is what it means to be on the other side of the world and following events in your country. And all you've got is media and phone calls. And then you call people and you're frustrated because it's not getting through. You're very, those details you, you capture very well. The other thing I found interesting is, if we can just, you know, we'll quickly talk about some of your other writing, is it feels to me that like all those other pieces of writing have an echo, sometimes more, sometimes less, but you, 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 you feel the echo in the book. For example, I love the, your personal writing, you know, the stuff that's in Hadithi, um, where you talk about your father and you talk about, now this one I'm really interested in, 12 ways to make him love you, right? Because then when you go into the book, this thing of love, you know, how different people love and what's going on is yeah. there. Um, I love that when you write about a place like visiting Kigali, or you know those 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 things of going to a place for the first time and seeing it as opposed to old places that you visited that comes through. Um, could you talk to me a little bit more about your nonfiction? What is it that drives that? And I notice you haven't been doing, or at least it doesn't look like you've been doing very much of it um, recently. Yeah. But what yeah. what what interests you in nonfiction? And then of course also you know you you, you mentioned uh, Chinamanda earlier um, and purple hibiscus, but I know you've also written. Uh, book reviews right mm -hmm. so talk to me a little bit about that work yeah um i <laughs> i think that i must say that you must be the the, the only person i've spoken to who's read <laughs> so much of my of my other stuff i can't believe you brought that that 10 steps to finding them i can't even know what it's called but thank you thank you and i'm very honored Michelle, that you would read um so much of my work um i am driven by things that that i find peculiar it's, it's strange because there's so many details that of threads and i guess it happens for everybody who writes when i see something there's going to be one thing that stands out that i that i will then get obsessed with i'll i'll give you an example of of, of the of the police truck that you you described i've never been arrested at least not to the point of getting into the the police truck but you're sitting in traffic half half the time behind one of these things with guys who you have you're wondering wondering what their story is so those things that, that are curious to me um are what kind of drives my nonfiction, and they haven't really changed much to be honest over the career of my writing like the way people find love and and how and what they do about it is still something that's curious to me now um the, the idea of family and the complexities of that, I, I am so close to my entire family. This book began because my father passed away. And when I said I had to get away, it's because I couldn't also be in Nairobi and, and imagine this city without my father. So family also sits in the center of, of, the, of, of the things that I care for. But my nonfiction is the writing, honestly, that I enjoy the most <laughs> because it comes, it comes the easiest to me. And it's also the writing that I've been paid the most for, to be honest, um, because it's just a wider, there's, a, there's, more, there's more money in the nonfiction publishing space, but, but also because a lot of the time I write nonfiction, it's for print publication and not online publication. Um, I haven't done much writing of anything recently. I think I've been quite, quite, quite focused on getting this book right. But um, when, I do, when I do write, I find that the thing that I explore in nonfiction always influence my fiction. Um, and, and that's the way that I, I test um my ability to stick through something um if if i if i lose interest in it i probably won't write fiction about it so i often test it out with getting an assignment that is about the same thing but it's a non-fiction assignment so i can see if the research will still hold my curiosity and if it does by the end of that project i'll probably explore fiction um with it and that's been the approach for my next book i i've been researching it for about a year um, and if I'm still interested in it now, then I'm just like, okay, let me put together one chapter um, because I need that curiosity to carry me through eight, nine, ten years of, well, hopefully not that long, but of the writing process. <laughs> hopefully it won't be that long. I just wanted to say, I think what you just said makes sense because like when we come to Havoc of Choice, and I'm going to start transiting to that, but I do want to ask you about um, two things. I think, for example, um, your research project with Outriders Africa, you, you say here, okay, I, this is what, and you'll tell us what you want to study, what, what you're looking at mm -hmm. um, in more detail, but you know, your theme is love and companionship. Mm -hmm. And so when I read the book this time, just, you know, this year when I was preparing for this, 
it struck me that what I love about the way you've explored this, and, and, and now it makes sense because you've been doing that research and that, you know, thinking about it, is that mm -hmm. I'm not sure I've seen a book that has explored the question of love and companionship in so many different relationships. So we are talking about there's romantic love, but parent and child, sibling, in-laws, friends, mm -hmm. colleagues, employer, employee, I mean, the guy who's sitting in a police station and the police officer, public servant to citizen, faith leader to the congregation. There are just so many ways that you're coming back to this, this thing of relationships and how it holds us together. And so I thought, okay, now it makes sense that you've invested the time into it. So just a minute, Outriders Africa, tell me about that. Okay. Outriders Africa is a project of the Edinburgh Book Festival that happened in 2019. 20, oh my god 2020 and the project kind of paired 10 writers from different parts of the world with each other so we have five pairs um traveling around the continent of africa together and the goal was to see if these two writers would see the same thing in the same countries so you you get paired up you pick where you're going you get between five and seven countries and you have a month um or to two months to travel so my topic of and every writer has their own kind of topic of, of inquisition. And mine was, was that it was love and companionship. Um, and and my, my main kind of area of curiosity was this city of ours, this country of ours called Kenya evolved so quickly and so fast and in such beautiful and also sometimes ugly ways. But suddenly with all of this Silicon Savannah and tech and everything happening, the, the way that, that the young people, not even young people, people who are just not um, married or, 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 or partnered with, with, their, with their life partners, People who are single are expected to kind of dance the same way that they were um, for the last 40, 50, 60 years. And that doesn't seem like it fits right for many people. So I wanted to see what, what it's like in, in Banjul and what it's like in Dakar. And, and for the month of February and March last year, before the lockdown, I'd spent six weeks traveling across um, West Africa with, with a Nigerian poet asking these questions, going on the dating apps and seeing, are there people using apps in Senegal to date? And if so, what is the outcome? Um, the goal is obviously to, 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 to explore this in, in, in nonfiction, which I have done, but I'm currently, um, we're reviewing the final draft of an article that will be published next year, alongside all the other writers who went on the, on the individual journeys. And for the long time for me that I want to explore that in fiction, and I, I don't know where, what that looks like yet, but I'm at the point in the process where I can put down a first chapter and see where that goes. Um, and hopefully that will be the next piece of work that, I, that I'm busy with. Oh, wow. I, I really look forward to that. And then my final question as we go into the book is, um, you have an essay, Lady Macmillan, the library, that led to both book banks and bank books. Again, and bank books, I just want to say, are the, the publishers of this. And there are not many people who I know who not only set out to write a book, but then set up <laughs> not just to publish, to self-publish, but a publishing company, and then make sure that those who can't buy the books have a place to go and read them. I think that's amazing. Just tell me a little bit about this. Yeah, um, thank you. And, and those two things are connected to my life as a writer. When I, when I decided that I'm going to be a writer for the rest of my life, and then I looked at the industry, I'm like, okay, but if my book is 2,000 shillings in the Nairobi bookstores, who's going to buy it? Only maybe one or 2% of Kenyans will. So then libraries began to make sense. Um, as a writer, libraries are the place where people who can't afford to buy your book and go and read it. And those are people who actually most of the time need it the most or want it the most. So BookBank is an organization that um, my friend Angela Washuka and I co-founded um, in 2017 with the sole purpose of restoring public libraries. She and I were, were, were walking through the city one day. We were working on a literary festival um, and we're looking for a space to hold an event. And we thought libraries make sense, right, for literary events. But walking to the Macmillan in Nairobi, which is Nairobi's oldest library and Kenya's second oldest library, and it looked like it hadn't been touched in 50 years. Um, even if it was a, pub, a, a public library, it was open, it was, it was run by the, the city council at the time, but it didn't have much love. And so what we set out to do is to adopt these spaces and to transform them um, into the kind of cities that, or kind of places that we think reflect the city and that the city needs. Um, we found some success, we've had some success. We discovered on the way, on the journey that the, the Macmillan had two more branches that we're, we've now renovated. We spent last year renovating those and the plan is to do the third branch um, this year. But the publishing arm actually was something that Washuka and I had wanted to do even before <laughs> libraries were a thing um, or a thing for us. 
And it was simply ar around um, the fact that even when we do have these libraries up and running, we will need the, the industry or the ecology or the ecosystem to, to have a, a, a steady stream of fiction by us coming into them and not just by me, but by as many people as we can publish. And that is truly the impetus um, behind both Bookbank and Bank Books. We, we, um, we want to make sure that by the time we retire <laughs> from this work that we've changed or enriched the entire industry, not just from libraries, not, public, not just publishing, because those things should be symbiotic and I don't think that they have been in the past. Wow, thank you. I, I appreciate that work. I, I know we, we're here to talk about the writing, but I just want to thank you for that work that we are creating the ecosystem. And that's not easy to do, but that some people are out there. So the havoc of choice, right? Yeah. So I read the first three minutes and in these first three minutes, you meet the Googies, you know, the protagonist Kavata, her husband Gugi, and their children Wanja and Amani. And let me just say this for those of you who don't speak Swahili, um, Kavata Ngugi and Wanja, those are everyday Kenyan names, but Amani means peace. And when you read the book, it's really significant. Well, it helps if you know that the word, um, uh, that the name Amani also means peace. It's the eve of an election. We know Ngugi is contesting. Kavata is planning something and we don't know what. So what is the book about? Why should we care about this family? What, what, what's, what's, this, what's going to happen to us? So, um... Kavata is about to make a decision and we don't know why or, 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 or how, um, but she's planning an exit and it's because her, her husband, who she's loved since we were in university together, has made a decision to run for office and it's not one that sits right with her, given her history as, as living in the shadow of her father, who was a very unscrupulous um, politician. So her decision to leave um, um, her husband kind of... She, shatters or sends her family in different directions and, and literally like figuratively and literally they all go to different parts of the country because as those of you who are familiar with how we vote in Kenya most people go up country to vote very people stay in Nairobi to vote but most people go and vote at home where they need there's a bit more attachment to like the 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 area um so this happens in the book and and when when Kavasa leaves so does um her 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 family goes to Machakos where they're supposed to be voting and they all go to different parts of the country and they have and they have the, the election kind of happen the election kind of happens and we're taken through we're taken through the back end of what what I imagine <laughs> or what the author imagines a an election would, would, is run like and on the day that the results are announced the country is split in three parts there's those who are happy with the results there's those that are happy and there are those that are caught in the middle of this what ends up being a month and a half to two months of, of really, really, really fraught violence. The book only tackles the first week, but we, the, we, the book then takes us through what, what it was like to, to be in the middle of what was Kenya's worst possible election. In the end, there's obviously casualties, there's obviously um, a reflection on choices and, 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 and their repercussions of love and on family and all of these things that Mshai um, talked about before. Um, and it's a book that for the, on the surface looks like it's about politics and how we vote, but I think it, and I, and I really like to stress that it, 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 in my heart is a book about choices because it's not only about elections and, and who you pick to lead. It's about how you make every single other choice in your, in your, in your life because we, we have this, this army of people that we don't see who, whose existence, if you're a middle-class Kenyan, is to make, the existence serves to make your life easier or more comfortable, not easier, but a bit a little more comfortable. And I don't think we think about those people that often. And because we don't think about those people, we don't think about who we're voting for a bit more often. Because again, if you're middle class, it's very, very rare that the repercussions of the violence will hit you the way that they do people who live in the slums. So it's a book that kind of laid out a week in December 2017, 20, 2007, and, and laid it out in as much detail as I could manage. <laughs> um, yeah. And, 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 you know, what you just said, you know, the title, The Havoc of Choice, it's easy to go in and just focus on, okay, when is the violence going to happen? But you lay the groundwork for us to really think about the choices people make and the consequences. And everybody in the book is making choices. Sometimes they're tiny choices. Sometimes they're big choices. Some of the choices have got, you know, it may seem like a small choice and then it's got such huge reverberations. And some of them are, you know, you know, sometimes it's the same choice. So two people in the book will choose to give a stranger a car ride. And we see, you know, it can go in different directions. Or, you know, somebody will decide in this situation, I'll stay. 
somebody else will decide they'll go. And, and what happens to them is, is you know, the impact is life-changing. And then in another situation, the person who left is the person who, who you know, has the problems and the one who stays is the one who remains safe. So it's those little, little choices that I think you do so well. One of my favorite quotes is Anne, who, by the way, I have to tell you, I love Anne. I'm Kavata's friend. Maybe she's my favorite character, but there's a point where she says, you have the benefit of all my poor decisions. And I think that's such a critical line that we learn from our choices. It won't always go well, but we learn from our choices. Um, why don't you just um, share any reading that you feel, just give us a little bit more of a taste of the book. Happy to. Um, I wanna read a section, one of my favorites and has become a bit of a crowd favorite. It um, intro introduces you to Chepto. And for some context, Chepto is the wife of Kavata's driver who has suffered probably the, the mm, I, I don't wanna put suffering on that skill, but has suffered greatly because of Kavata's choices. And I don't know, let me just, I don't know if I can do any justice. Like, I'm sure you've given me such. <laughs> you read it beautifully because you know it. I've read first, so you should have read, they should have been the one to open up the reading session. Anyway, I'll, I'll give it my best shot. Chapto was resting on the side of the road, peeling off the bandages on the side of her face. They were moist and unsightly and did nothing for their cause. Kabata gasped when she saw how badly Chepto's face was injured. She went over to help with the new bandages. What happened, Chep? Kabata tried one last time, this time in Kikuyo. There was a long silence before Chepto spoke and she started with the day that Kabata left. She begged Thuo to tell the police what he knew about Kabata's disappearance, but he just refused to speak even when he was being called a criminal. She told her about the days and the nights she'd spent looking around the house for clues about where Kavata might have been so that she could take them to the police station and have her husband relieved. Knowing that it was up to him, Thor would remain locked up for months, unable to speak for himself. She explained that the only reason she left Nakuru at the very last minute was because she didn't want to leave her husband behind rotting away in a jail cell. Then she talked about the violence and the killing in Nakuru and about the church in Eldoret. Everything that Kavata wanted to say felt inadequate because it was. Chepto's rage was justified. Everything that Chepto's family had suffered over the course of the past week was linked to, Kav to Kavata's choice. She put Thor in that cell and Chapter would never have been in Eldoret by herself if Thor was with her. She would never have seen all those things. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm so, so, so sorry. I don't know what else I can say Chapter, but I am sorry. She continued to chant her apology and Chapter just looked at her. It was never my intention. Of course you can say it was never your intention, but it's your fault. Because for me, there's no difference between those two things. I understand your anger, Chepto. Don't say that you understand my anger because you never will. You know, Mama Wanja, I have always admired you, even before we met, when Thor was working for your parents. You were always so determined not to take after your father. I was happy when Thor told me that you took a job teaching. I thought it must be nice to work just because you want to, not because you must. I can tell you today, that you are nothing like your father. These words brought Kavata some respite. You are not like him, but you are not better than him either. Muli, he's aware of his power and he knows how to use it. He knows it's danger, but you, 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 you don't. You don't understand that every little thing you do affects Sisi Watua Dogo. Please, Chepto, don't call yourself small. There's no such, ah, Chepto rolled her eyes, but we are. We are small people because we're the ones who are always shifting our lives so that, you, so that yours can stay the same. When you tell Thor to work late, it means that we don't get to eat on time or at all because he brings home our supper. When you tell him to lie to your husband about where you are, and I'm sorry, but I don't care why you did it. Thor will do so, even if it means he sits in jail for a few days. And you don't know it, 
because you never have to live with the consequences of your choices. Just like these politicians who will never have to suffer a day because of this election. Kuna watu na viatu. Stop denying that to yourself. Chapter waited for a response, but Kavata didn't have one. It was a truth that she had never considered. She just hung her head. And Chapter, she softened her voice. Listen, I know you don't think of these things, and I know that you are a good person. Lakini, you must open your eyes. You and I are not the same. And to think that we are is stupid. Kenya in a wenyewe, and you are one of them. I'll stop there. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I, I had this review I wanted to quote a little bit and it's like, nobody will believe we didn't plan this, but I think it's a, that, that, that conversation for me too is one of my favorites where you have two women who are able to talk about, you know, just, it's just so many things. Okay, this is what happened to me. This is what happened to you. But then to talk about what are the implications and how our lives affect each other. Uh, Miss Goey uh, in, in, is writing and, and you know, the, you know her, her, her blog is called Young, Gifted and Black. And one of the things she said, and I just want to pick up on some of the things she says here. I had sworn off books about post-election violence in Kenya, mostly because I think they get a bit redundant. And I feel like, okay, we get the point. It was really bad and people died, you know. However, this might be the first time I've seen so many perspectives explored. The regular people perspective I'm used to, but usually from the view of one group of people being persecuted by the other. She also shows us the politician side and most impressive of all is that the politician ends up getting personally wounded by the mess he was part of creating. Koinange shows how thin the line is between victim and villain. Usually when the us versus them dichotomy is created, there's a clear villain and clear victim. Koinange says to hell with all of that and blurred every single line and I live for it. And I think that's, you know, we, 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 we follow Kavata, she's a protagonist, but we also get a chance to see she's not always right, right? And we see, you know, all of these, um, almost every character, we see this real humanity about them. Um, even the ones that we you know were really like, that was a really bad decision, but then there's a redeeming factor about that. And I find that just really, really powerful um, about just, you know, what you did with your, with, with your characters. Um, this line, the personal is political came to mind as I was reading it. I think what you also show us is that the political is personal. No. Um, why was that important for you? You know, we all love to hate politicians. Why did you want to humanize them or, or take us behind the scenes? You know what it was? It, it's also just checking myself because before, before 2020, actually, even after having finished this book, I always said, said to myself that I'm not political, that I'm very apolitical, I don't care. And those who know me well, to be honest, the biggest shock is that I could capture the politics so well because I haven't really been a consumer. I don't watch the news and I only will watch it if there's something relevant to my life that is, that is happening. But then when, when, my, my sister, who I'm, um, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm the last in the family of five, and my sister read the book, and she's closest to me. Um, she's the closest person to me in the world, basically. And she said she could not understand how I could get into, into politics in that way. And it realized that a lot of the time we think that we're apolitical, we think it doesn't matter, but so much seeps in, and it becomes such a constant part of our lives that we don't understand that it matters. You can't be apolitical. You can't be apolitical when the decisions that are happening at that level affects your everyday life, even if it's not everyday life for you, it is for someone. Um, and, and that for me was important because I needed to show that, um, like, <clears throat> excuse me, like Goi mentioned, I too had read everything I could find um, about the violence before I wrote this book. I did the research. And those stories I, I weren't hearing, and it was often it was the affluent story, the story about the politicians, it was stories about um, areas that weren't kind of the hotspots of the violence. And I really wanted to bring those in. What was it like to be living in the US, being a Kenyan living in the US when your country is burning? I know many things about my relationship with my country, but I know that if my country is burning, I want to be here with my family. I don't want my family suffering when I'm away. And there's all of these things, but I wanted to bring it back to the, to the human beings, the level of the human and what they do every day. Um, and, and just because we, we haven't really, we really think about like things at a high level. When we say Kenya is corrupt, we blame leadership first. But like most leaders were people before they were leaders. And, and, and when, when 
things, I, I see Kenyans being corrupt every single day. When I watched um, Boniface's film, Sorti, it broke my heart because I realized even if we had a, a leadership that was completely speak, speak and span, there'd still be so much work to do. And I think that instead of expecting the work to happen from the top down, we need to start doing it from the bottom up. That way, when we're, when we're calling leaders to a standard, it's one that we have lived and we live every day. Um, so there's a lot of work to be done um, around our collective reflection as a country, but also individually. And this book forced me to, and I hope it does for, for readers as well. And certainly what is, 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 you know, now that you mention it, is common about um, the film Softy, um, directed by Sam Sonko, so Soko, uh, but about the Mwangi family, Boniface Mwangi's family, is that you look at the impact on a family and how it is that in one family, people can think so differently and politics can really divide us. So how do you keep that, you know, I may disagree with your politics, but we still need to be able to be family. How do we work on that? And I think that's, that's really powerful. And I really appreciate it that we don't only see it between husband and wife, but we also see how children get affected. And um, there's a question uh, I just, uh, that, that has come in and I, I would like to ask you this before um, my final uh, questions, but Abraham, Nganga says, Wanjiro, thanks and congratulations. I look forward to getting hold of your book and reading it. Here's my question. You make the point that you needed to return home in order to make your book more contextually authentic. I wonder though, in removing the Cape Town experience from your book, do you end up shortchanging the reader in terms of your global identity? In other words, are we not both local and global in the quest for the authentic identity? That's an incredible question. Thank you, Ibrahim. I think that it's, I, I don't have a yes or no answer. I think it's likely that I robbed um, the readers of a global perspective, but when I wrote this book, I wrote it for Kenyans first. So it had to be, it had to be true for Kenyans first. And, and to be honest, even at the point when I was writing it, I was, I was, the earlier address probably did that at, an, at a disadvantage to other readers, but I, I wanted this book to resonate with Kenyans first and the Cape Town perspective didn't seem important. Um, there, there was no kind of part of any of the characters worlds where they would be in Cape Town. Um, and I guess that's, that's, the, that's the, the kind of space that you, where you have to disconnect yourself from, from the, the, the fiction that you're creating because a lot of it was, was um, there was a lot of Cape Town in the book, but it was misplaced because none of the characters had any um, right, had any business speaking with an Afrikaans accent or, or speaking Afrikaans words. And, and there's a lot of those kinds of small inflections that that I'm pretty sure if I left them in there would have been picked up by Kenyan audiences. So because it was for Kenyans first, I was happy to sacrifice everything else um, for that. I, I just want to link to that um, a question that Dr. Radha Updaya has put in, and this, this brings us to the question of language. Um, mm -hmm. She says, I was just surprised with the use of term Mamawanja. I always thought in Kiswahili, the mother is referred to with the name of the last born. I have something to say about that, but my mother is always referred to Mama Sita, my younger sister, and not, you know, as the older one. So both just in terms of your thoughts on that, but then also why why Kis why, why, why is there's a lot of not just Kiswahili, I think there's a bit of Kikuyu, there may be a bit of Kikamba, but mixed into the story. Why? Why was this important to you? Because I think that's how we speak. I think I think the people that have that well, maybe that's not how we speak, but the people that have been around me and have been responsible for forming the human that is Wanjiru speak that way. Um, and I know it's said a lot that you must write what you know, but I think that writing what you know means that you can do it justice. Um, I think we we have over 40 languages in this country and we don't necessarily stick to one. I know I don't. Um, and I love it. It's one of my most favorite things about the way we speak, not only in Kenya, but I think on the continent, we just, we dance around the language so much. And in fact, one of my biggest regrets to this day is, is italicizing the non-English words because in Kenya, in a book about Kenya, set in Kenya and featuring Kenyan characters, English should be italicized, to be honest, because we 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 kind of we we muddle it and we and we and we change and we color it up so much. So I wish that I had kind of kept the font um consistent, and we might just do that for a second edition. Um, but the, the the additional language was important because that is in the spirit of how we speak as Kenyans. Um, and I wondered if it then would lock um other non Kenyans out. But this book was edited by a Mexican woman. For, well, my, my agent is Indian, and she was the first reader. The Mexican was one of 
um, Mexican one was one of two editors, the third one was Kenyan, and it was a UK reader as well. So though that language slipped through all of those kind of filters and still held true. Um, and even if it did it, I would have fought that fight to keep it in there. Um, maybe in, in, in subsequent deals, whether the, a, a, an, an addition for a different part of the world, we might change that. But this East African one <laughs> must be, must retain its language. Yeah, I just wanted to say to Rather, so usually it is the name of the firstborn whom a mother retains, but in certain cases, especially when the younger one is the one who is known. So I remember when my parents who, you know, we were born and brought up in Nairobi, my parents moved um, to Taita when we were, the older ones were all in high school, so we were in boarding school. So people where we, you know, when they went and settled, they all knew my younger brother. And we were all pretty upset when we came home from holidays and everybody was referring to my mother by as Mama Leonard, my youngest, my youngest brother. And we were like, oh, no, 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 no. There are four of us ahead four. of him. How dare, you know, and we were quite offended. So sometimes it happens because that's the person, you know, children will often call you Mama so or Baba so and so, whoever that, that you know. Wanjiro, I'm so sorry that we're coming so quickly to the end, but I did want, I know there's a question that's come up on Zoom and we've answered it there, but for everybody else who is listening, is there a place we can go to find your work where you could link, link us to all the different work that you've done? And secondly, um, if I'm interested in the book, can I get it online? Um, how, how do I, how can I get hold of it? Okay. Um, yes. You can access everything about my, my professional life on my website, manjirokoinange.com. Um, it's an, that is an archive of all of my writing. Um, it's a bookstore for my books. Um, I, have, I have written short stories. I have pub edited poetry collections that are all available um, on my site. Um, it also link you to all of my work, the book bank work and the, and the bank books as well. Um, the book is available. Um, in East Africa by a textbook center who um, are selling it both in store across Kenya and online. And if you're um, buying it online, they will ship to everywhere in East Africa, actually even to the rest of the continent um, by a textbook center. Um, and then if you're in India, there's a bookseller called Champaka Books in Bangalore that are that's shipping it all across India. It's also available via my UK publisher, Jacaranda Books on Amazon and via my website and theirs. And I'm hoping for more book deals so we can get it um, in other regions. The ebook is also available. Actually, we haven't even announced it yet, but because um, this is the, the first event of the, of the year, um, we can share a link to buy the Kindle version um, on Amazon as well. Thank you very much. And we will, as um, the Columbia Global Center Nairobi, if you go to our webpage when this comes up, There'll be details and links to all of that for anybody who would like to go. You'll be able to go there, get some snippets from today's conversation and, and continue just to connect both with us and with Wanjiro through there. Wanjiro, what would your last words be? If, 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 you, if I'm thinking, okay, this sounds really, really interesting. What do you want me to take away? If I forget everything else that you've said, what would you like me to take away? Oh, my goodness. I think that I would, I would desire that the book sparks conversation. So if there's one person that you ordinarily would not be able to talk about the, the, the difficulty of the way that, that we do elections, that we make choices, um, I'm having a lot of conversations with my family about like breaking down <laughs> the way we've done things, and even just like how we approach tribalism in this country, because it's still some things that are so innate to us that I don't think that we think about. So I think that it would be, I hope that the book is a, is a, a tool to begin some, some important conversations, but more importantly, more than the conversations, if you don't want to have a confrontation, I hope that the book encourages us to think beyond ourselves when we're making a choice. Just take seven seconds before you make a choice, before you tick a box to be like, who does this decision affect and how can I, how can I consider them? It could be your Boda Boda guide, it could be the lady who takes care of your children, it could be who you vote for, it could also be like how we, how, who, where we're, all our kids are going to school and what we're doing in a pandemic with our children. But I think that if we if we made the big decisions the way we make those small ones about or what feels like small, where kids go to school, if we picked our leaders the way we pick kindergarten, what I like to say, then we'd be in a much better place as a as a as a world. <laughs> yeah. 
yeah yeah we will thank you very very much for getting us off to such a great start into 2021 i know i'll be reading this book again i definitely will be teaching it and sharing it because i think there's so many important um things that you say and you you enable us to do i was thinking of daisy hernandez has got a, a, a an essay where she talks about this word testament um she talks about the, the difference between being a witness and giving a testimony. And she goes to the Spanish roots and she says, testimonio, quoting David Yudis, is an authentic narrative told by a witness who is moved to narrate by the urgency of the situation. Truth is summoned in the cause, in the cause of denouncing a present situation of exploitation or oppression, or in excising and setting a right official history. I think you do that so powerfully, not just in terms of national events, but also in terms of the personal things that we ourselves, as you said, the choices that we make, that we make without thinking, the big choices, the small choices, that we have to keep coming back into this place of memory, not to further traumatize ourselves, but to be able to heal. I, I just want to join with everybody who's online, um, maybe the best, I'll say it in the words of Antoine, um, uh, who says, many thanks for giving us such an intriguing snippet of the book. I'll definitely try to get it. And I think we are all saying that. This is um, CGC Nairobi. We are, um, we are just winding up with the third of our book conversations where we have featured Wanjiru Koinange with her book, The Havoc of Choice. Please join us as we continue to bring you the Africa Book Talk. Look us up on Facebook, look us up on our website where you will find a recording. Please share it with those who are not able to join us. You'll find a recording of this. You'll find links to all of Wanjiro's amazing works and you will be able to register so that next time we have another talk, you will be able to, to join us. Thank you to everybody at CGC Nairobi who has made this possible for Wanjiro, for Mike, um, who continues to do such a wonderful job in curating. And we will see you next time. Thank you, everybody.